Hey, here we are on the June 2011 exam. This is page 7, the beginning of part B1. Why don't you answer all these questions? So let's start with question 36. What's the approximate diameter of an inflated basketball? I don't know anything about sports, so I'm just going to give... This is a, uh, what's known as a proportionality question. They don't know if you know anything about basketball, but what they really want to know is, do you know what these times powers means? So it's 2 times 10 to the first. So basically that's 2 times 10, so that's 20 meters. You suppose a basketball is 20 meters in diameter? Nah, it can't be 20 meters. Well, if that's times, if this is 20, then this has got, is an order of magnitude, so this has got to be 2 meters. 2 times 1 is what that is. Um, so that's 2 meters. Well, a basketball is not 2 meters either. So now we're over here. This is a tenth of a meter. So it's two tenths of a meter or two hundredths of a meter. Well, two hundredths of a meter is called two centimeters. And two centimeters is about that much. So even if you don't know anything about basketball, you do have a rough idea of how big a ball has to be in order for humans to play with it. Two centimeters would be marbles. I guess this would be one of those big beach ball type things, but 20 meters. Question 37. The graph shows the relationship between the speed and the elapsed time for an object falling from rest near the surface of the planet. So in one second, its speed is increased to about uh, two something. Two seconds, it's increased to four something. So definitely not the Earth. If this was the Earth, it would have increased by 10 meters per second every second. So what do they want to know? What is the total distance the object falls during the first three seconds? Two different ways you can do this. During the first three seconds, you go from 0 to 8. So if velocity initial is 0, velocity final is 8 meters per second. Average velocity is going to be initial plus final divided by 2, or 4 meters per second. And average velocity is distance over time, so distance is equal to average velocity times time. So 4 meters per second times 3 seconds, that looks like a distance of 12 meters, and sure enough, that would be the choice, 12 meters. Now another technique to remember is that the area under a velocity time graph, a speed time graph, the area under that graph is the distance you travel. So the area of this triangle is the distance you traveled. And uh, this particular triangle is 8 high, 3 across, and it's 1 half base times height. So 3 times 8, 24, half of that 12. We still get 12 meters of distance. Question 38. A 75 kilogram hockey player skating across the ice at a speed of 6 meters per second. What is the magnitude of the average force required to stop the player in 0.65 seconds? Well, I've got mass, 75 kilograms. I've got uh, velocity initial, 6 meters per second. Velocity final is going to be zero. I'm looking for the force and I know it's going to take a time of 0.65 seconds. Well, there's a couple of different ways to do that. You can say it's got momentum and what's the impulse, but well, let's go ahead and do that. Force equals mass times acceleration. Force is required to uh, change this guy's velocity. So I can write force is equal to mass times change in velocity over time. And uh, gosh, that's what they're looking for. They give us the mass. We've got the change in velocity. We've got the time, we're looking for force. So we plug in uh, 75 kilograms times 6 meters per second, divided by 0.65 seconds. I'm looking at about uh, 690 newtons. Question 39, a child pulls a wagon at a constant velocity, constant velocity. That force is zero. Along a level sidewalk, the child does this by applying 22 newtons of force at uh, 35 degrees to the sidewalk. 
Okay, 35 degrees. So part of the force, part of that 22 is pulling it forward, part of that 22 is lifting it up. And the question is, what is the magnitude of the force of friction on the wagon? So this is kind of a multi-level problem. In order to uh, pull it forward, there's a force, and that force is going to be the horizontal component of this 22 newton force here. So let's see, my any vector's x component is equal to any vector times the cosine of the angle. So this is going to be 22 newtons times the cosine of 35 degrees. So that's the force pulling it that way. Now that should cause it to accelerate, but we're told it's constant velocity. So the net force is zero, which means whatever this force is, the force of friction has got to be equal, but in the opposite direction. So the force of friction is going to be equal to 22 times the cosine of 35. Well, 22 is going to, uh, times the cosine of 35 is going to be less than 22. So even if I don't have a fancy calculator, I can still do that. And uh, gosh, I just get my calculator out. And the cosine of 35 is uh, 0 0.81 times 22. I'm getting about 18. So I've got an 18 Newton horizontal component. Force of friction has got to be equal to 18 Newtons as well. Question 40. The diagram below shows the arrangement of three small spheres, A, B, and C, having charges of 3Q, Q, and Q. Spheres A and C are located distance R from sphere B, so sphere B is right in the middle. So, compared to the magnitude of the electrostatic force, all right, it's going to ask me a complicated question, so let's just play with it a little bit. This force is going to be KQQ divided by R squared. KQQ divided by R squared. So uh, whatever K is times 1 times 1 divided by R squared. This force here is going to be equal to K3Q Q over R squared. Let's say the R is 1 and each of the Q's is 1. I don't even know. So this is basically going to be 3F to F. So the force between B and C is F. The force between A and B is going to be 3F. So let's go see what the question actually says now that we know the answer. Compared to the magnitude of the electrostatic force exerted by sphere B on C, which is F, the magnitude of the electrostatic force exerted by sphere A on, oh, uh, A on C Oh, great. Well, now we've got to do a little bit more. So now this is 3, but now this turns into 2. I'm going to do this again. A on C, force A on C is going to be, the force is going to be equal to 3Q, K, times 3Q times Q divided by 2 squared. So it's going to be 3 over 4. So it's going to be 3 fourths as much, which, as it turns out, is one of the choices. This is called a proportionality problem. The way I dealt with it was this. I simply arbitrarily assigned 1s to all of my variables. They're not giving me any numbers, so I can do whatever I want. So I say, okay, it's 1 times 1 times 1 divided by 1 squared. So the force is equal to 1. And so in this problem, I just change whatever variables they're asking. So now my force is equal to k times 3q times q divided by distance uh, double, so now it's 2 squared. And then these are all 1s, I just uh, eliminated them. And my force is 3 over, don't forget to square it, 4. What if 3 halves? Yeah, 3 halves was there as well if you forgot the formula. So I put the formula down first and then I manipulate it as they change it.